This is how to make a World War II film with not a lot of money. I'm shit at writing scripts, so I wrote a script. Making World War II films is really difficult, and this film was no exception. And turn over. This was a catastrophic mess, production was. I mean, just you look at any of the pictures of me filming this, and I just, I look like death warmed up. I want to share my experience of making the film, hopefully give you some advice on where to get convincing props, uh, costumes and weapons of the period, uh, how to get together a great cast and find some really awesome locations that suit this World War II setting. So if you're going to make a film like this, it's good to have a real interest in the subject matter and the history. I personally love old World War II films, that's what I grew up watching. I particularly like films from the 60s, 70s, stuff like The Longest Day, Where Eagles Dare, uh, Kelly's Heroes. I generally like the history from that period. Um, I used to make World War II videos um, on this channel. But this is an entirely different project. This was something that I needed to take a little more seriously. It wasn't kind of like a run and gun YouTube shoot um, with absolutely um, no story. This radio station was actually banned in France under the German authorities and um, if you were caught listening to it you could be arrested and so on. It was something that was done in secret but it really brought families together, you know, they'd all sit around the radio. In one case this family were playing it really smart by going upstairs and listening to the radio under blankets to muffle the sound so you couldn't hear it outside and they'd have their kids out on the road playing, they would kind of make up like a signal when the patrol was coming past or something and then they'd, they'd turn it down and so on. And I thought that's really cool and wanted to figure out a way that I could maybe build in some conflict in there as well. I think it could also be something that divides a family as well because by listening to that radio you are endangering your family or you're placing your family under suspicion, you know. So I came up with this idea where there's a guy that's obsessed with the radio and he's using that as a way of kind of um, fighting back against the German oppression. But his sister um, is strongly opposed to that because she just wants them to, to live out the war safely. It centers around this radio and um, that kind of like little cottage environment. Um, but at the same time, I wanted some scale to the project as well. I wanted uh, that kind of classic war feel, kind of widescreen lockdown gunfights in the woods, uh, convoys, that kind of stuff. I think that's something that is very difficult to do, create scope and scale. I was certainly pushed to my limits and very nearly failed. The goal was to start with something simple and down to earth and then expand it out into a big sabotage operation. What I also really wanted to do was establish a tone pretty quickly. I wanted to open on kind of the gray, um, dark coastline and I wanted to see the German defences, just kind of establish a sense of place. Um, as long as I created a believable world from the very start, then I, then, um, I would be happy, you know? First thing you should really do is get to work on the cast, it's the most important thing. But in my case, I actually worked on my locations first and there's a few reasons for that. The main one being that I wasn't really confident in the script at the time. I wanted to get those locations down pretty early, uh, just so that then when I approach the cast, it convinces them to commit to your project because they can see that you've already laid out the groundwork. They know where you're shooting. Um, they can start making arrangements of their own. And it just gives them the confidence that when they do agree to do it, that it's actually going to be a thing that happens. <laughs> and it works the other way as well. And no matter how early you lock down your cast, there's no guarantee that they're gonna stick with the project all the way through, you know? Oh, wow. Here we go. Get it. It, depending on where you live, it is difficult to find locations that suit that World War II environment, especially when it's something structural like a like a house. 
or even worse, like a town or a village or something like that. You've got to have the right kind of architecture. It's got to look bloody old. In England, there's a real variety of um, old properties, and uh, so it's not too difficult to find something. But what is difficult to find is old interiors that you can shoot in. I was scouring the coastline, and I found this little building. Um, I was hoping that it was uh, kind of like an abandoned property that I could just kind of trespass on and it looked great, it was perfect. Everything lined up exactly how I wanted it. I have some regrets about it, just because it, it's distance from our base, which ended up being an absolute killer. The cottage looked great on the outside, but then once you looked in, it was like, um, it was like the Tate. It was all modern inside, um, with all sorts of weird sculptures and stuff. Um, so I knew that I'd have to find an interior that matched up with that building. Zach, who was the first AD on this film, um, actually found a location that he thought could suit uh, my cottage. And uh, it was like a self-catering accommodation. It was a really old property. Um, and that was the first real hit, budget-wise, was paying to have access to the cottage. So it does help to find kind of like a private property that's either a holiday home or a quiet uh, family home that has some space where you can kind of work um, and not disturb the owners too much. I discovered the little cupboard in the corner for the, would be good for the switch, for the radio upstairs. A lot of things were lining up. Um, I figured that maybe I could dress it up a little bit inside to make it look old and it had just about the right kind of size um, and the windows matched up really well Ooh. with the um, property down by the coast so it was all looking really good but I still failed to kind of notice that this was a really tiny cottage. It's going to be a lot of us in there, a lot of lights and equipment. These needed to be functional locations. I knew that they needed to be functional but I think I was just so excited about um, how they would look aesthetically that I kind of slipped up a little bit on some of the practicalities like the size of the cottage and the fact that there was no phone signal in either of those locations. So the next step is to approach the people that own these properties and that can be a quite a daunting thing to do because again you have nothing to really offer them. Um, you haven't got any money, you're stuffed. So you've got to be really nice and you've got to be quite passionate as well about your project and know a lot about your project. People are going to ask you everything and there's no secret to it, you just got to go and talk to them. You have to just start talking to them. I know it's, it seems like it's going to be an impossible task to convince certain people. I was going to be asking to be running around with guns and a lot of people are quite sensitive about these things so you never know quite what to expect. With the exterior I was having hard work finding out who lived there just because this was in the middle of nowhere. I didn't know anyone around the area so I ended up having to go through like a local parish council um, and work my way through each member until I found somebody that knew who lived there. I think it pays off if you're making a World War II film to find some structures that look old um, because although a lot of action took place out in the fields, the rolling fields and in the bocage and in the hedgerows of Normandy, France, there were still old barns, there were villages that you would have to pass through and it just makes, it just really helps to build this world um, rather than it just being a few blokes in the woods. I can't stand blokes in the woods walking about. Weapons, costume, props, this is the make or break <laughs> for, a, for a period World War II film. Um, if you've got a lot of action, you've got to have guns. If uh, you've got soldiers, even civilians, you need to have really convincing costume, um, especially military stuff. And military costumes difficult to do, especially if you don't own any at all, uh, and if you don't know anybody that owns any. That's, that's, that's a difficult start. Um, and what I would say is try not to buy stuff. I already had some gear. Um, obviously none of it was, it worked for YouTube videos, but it, I needed something more convincing for this film. I bought stuff, but I only bought stuff for principal characters, for certain actors. There's no good going out and spending all this money on, um, you know, dressing up three, four German soldiers or three, four American soldiers. It's, you're better off doing what I did and that was 
um, get some reenactment groups involved. Wherever you live, there's bound to be some reenactment groups around. I mean, do the same thing you would do with a cast, be really passionate about the project, maybe send them some material uh, or some even some past work that you've done. Call them up and you know, ask if anybody, because there's a lot of people involved in these groups, so chances are one or two of them are going to be available. Uh, not all of them. It's a big ask to have the entire group there, but if you can just get two or three from one group and maybe one or two from another group, then you're not going to get anything more authentic than reenactors. Also, airsofters are a good contact as well. If you do airsoft or you know someone that does or you know there's an airsoft site nearby, it might be worth going down and um, speaking to some people because chances are someone's going to be dressed how you want them to be. Um, and that's what happened with me. I ended up going up and asking a couple of them if they'd be involved, if they want to be involved, and they said yes. They came with some extra gear as well, so I was able to take that and um, improve my loadout. So some of the props were actually DIY jobs. The dynamite was just candlesticks wrapped with parchment paper and then all tied together in a bundle. The detonator was an old military box found on eBay, just stuffed with polystyrene. Then it was just a simple case of getting an old corkscrew and shoving it into the polystyrene on top. Ivan's code book was just a simple notebook that was bought in a high street shop and we just roughed it up, scratched it up a little bit. I also updated gear I already had, like my German helmet, I spray painted that field grey to be more accurate. Ivan and Julia's costumes, civilian stuff, uh, that was actually all borrowed from a local theatre group so it's worth going down to a local theatre if you know there's one nearby, checking out if they have a costume department because they're probably very willing to let you borrow a couple of things. So the only weapon I actually bought for this film was the Car 98 and that was a Denix replica that I bought from Soldier of Fortune when I went to a military show. The rest of the guns were provided by reenactors themselves or the airsoft guys. So I didn't actually spend very much money at all on guns. The props inside the cottage are really important as well. It might not seem like there's a lot there but every single piece you see in there has been taken from somewhere. Either bought or borrowed and quite a lot of the stuff I actually borrowed from a B and B that had like lots of old collectibles and stuff, and they were really friendly, and they said that they and they let me kind of take a bunch of them, put them out, use them in the film, and then give them back. So that's a really good thing to do if you know anywhere like that. If you know someone in the family that might have cool stuff in their kitchen or whatever, you can take that um, and promise not to break it. Let's just reset really quickly. <laughs> really quickly. Still rolling. So the script was sort of coming along, so I started to work on my cast. What I did was I went through um, a, a like a casting website, like Casting Call Pro. I think it's called Mandy.com now. I think um, I'm sure there's kind of equivalents in whichever country you you're based in. Uh, this is a great way to go. Get yourself a page up there, like a job listing um, with all the information about your film. Uh, locations, uh, character bios and things like that. That's what I did um, and I just wanted to share my passion for the project and that's absolutely key. You really need to push that when you're trying to appeal to these uh, actors and they love World War II films, they love period films. It's great show reel material, photography material because they're in the costume and so you're kind of on the right lines by doing a World War II film anyway. I think you, you, you wouldn't find it too difficult to get a cast together but get that pre-production there so like um, uh, kind of like a draft schedule uh, details on where the locations are details on what kind of costume each character would be wearing and it's good to meet them as well I did uh, like a casting session I don't think it was like a hundred percent necessary to do this so don't worry too much but it, it really cements the relationship, your relationship with your actor. Um, you get a good kind of vibe from them um, or not. So I just picked a couple of scenes and just uh, built kind of like a little tiny set and then we just performed some stuff and it was really good. It was really good fun. And it's just so much easier uh, to pick your cast that way. I knew it was gonna be a difficult project so I really wanted people that were very passionate about the story and the film and people that had a lot of energy and uh, these guys definitely did. Lev who played the main character Ivan um, came along with a script and he'd written like all sorts of notes on and suggestions. He was immediately contributing to the project. Um, he wasn't just sitting down and reading the lines. That was a huge factor in um, picking him and I'm glad I did because it was tough physically and mentally tough and he was always 
ready to go. And same with Emma as well. She had so much positive energy. She struggled um, to get to the casting session because a car broke down or something and, and she still wanted to come to the session and that was like a big thumbs up. Okay, we're gonna go for a tick. Turn over. Oh. Something, something, something. Gabe, I can see your leg. See your leg. So the big problem with this film was that um, I had to direct and produce it, and that's mental. Um, you shouldn't ever have to do that, really, especially if you're doing something uh, on this scale. Um, you can't do both of those jobs at the same time. And the idea was that um, you'd produce the film efficiently enough so that then everything is in place when you get to the set, and you can turn off your producer head and just direct because everything's sorted out for you, scheduled, but it doesn't ever work like that. And it was an absolute disaster. I would definitely spread the load with someone uh, if I was doing this project outside of the university. There's no way I would do it all on my own because you've got to sort out everything. You've got to make sure all the actors turn up on time, uh, you know, all the really important stuff, but you've also got to be able to keep an eye on the small things. Like you've got to make sure that all of the right pots and pans are on the shelf in the background of the shot and where are you going to get them from? Um, so I had a really detailed schedule that I'd really thought out because I knew that once I got there, everything kind of just had to work. No phone signal is a real issue. Like if, if something goes wrong or an actor doesn't turn up on time, what are you gonna do? And there's not enough of us to, to sort that issue out. There's no location manager. There's no one there to sort these problems out. Uh, it's all on us. I was getting really worried about the scheduling. So I was like under my covers at about you know, four or five in the morning with the schedule trying to work out like let me move that scene here so that then we'd have more time to finish that one that we didn't finish the other night, you know, like it was just desperation. There's just no other way to describe the feeling. It's just had to finish the film, but it just seemed impossible. There was so much to do. It was difficult enough just doing those tiny little scenes in the cottage, never mind going to the woods with a HMI and shooting all this all these chases and the convoy and the truck and it's a lot of stuff. It may not seem like it when you're watching it because everything kind of flows. It took an hour and a half to get to the coast uh, from the cottage location. And you can imagine like how long it would take to get all the gear into the cars and the van, get down there, set everything up um, and then shoot and then come back again an hour and a half and then go to sleep wake up. I'd messed up my arrangements with the truck owner uh, because I've been so busy with the film um, that I'd forgotten to um, kind of remind them that they needed to get their truck down to the location at a certain time and whatnot and I ended up driving to location and um, no one was there to drive the truck or move it or anything we couldn't so we had to shoot something else entirely. We actually postponed it the next day and the guy who owned the truck had just been to a, a funeral and we were asking him if he could please come and take his massive truck down to the coast and do this scene and he was so nice about it and he did it um, but the truck ended up breaking <laughs> we'd just done a couple of shots and um, and it started spilling like radiator uh, fuel or whatever and um, uh, it was kind of out of action so luckily we got just about enough stuff a lot of the reasons why this is happening is because the film's too big for the, the course project. There are too many limitations for the size of the film that I'm trying to make. I'm squeezing it into this one week with five crew members. It's nuts. If you're ever going to make something like this, of course, give yourself enough time. Have the, the right number of people involved. <coughs> Hang on, could we just go back to the beginning of the lap? You and you in shot. I did the edit in Premiere. Um, I also did all the sound design in Premiere as well, and that's like a huge messy um, timeline. My old computer I've had for like eight years now, it's still doing well, I mean it finished this film, um, but it was a real stretch for it, it was very very time consuming waiting for stuff to render, even just placing like sound effects on the timeline. I've since 
updated my computer. The grade I initially did in Premiere and uh, it wasn't very good. Uh, I wasn't really using like a very good monitor or anything like that. Uh, it wasn't calibrated all too well. Generally speaking, everything was just way too bright. Um, <laughs> uh, I just needed to bring everything down. Uh, I since transferred everything over to DaVinci and done it that way um, and I'm much happier with it now. Visual effects is all After Effects, uh, just using techniques I've been using for years. There was nothing really major to do. Um, there's just a few kind of tricky tracking shots, just the window opening shot there where um, uh, I needed to replace um, the view outside the window with the coastline, because that was obviously shot in the interior location which didn't have that backdrop. And the guy stood on the coastline with a naval battery and apart from that there wasn't anything really too major. A lot of it was captured in camera really. Oh my Christ. Although there's a lot wrong with the film I think um, I'm very pleased with it considering how difficult it was to make. I think it's really important as a film student that the stuff you make has a life beyond your course. It doesn't just apply to uni students, you know, if you make any film you've got to think about where it's going to go and who's going to watch it. The intention was to always put this film on this channel but also to have a bit of uh, life in the festival world as well. It's been screened in several places uh, including Moscow and we went to a film festival there, that was really good fun. The film's created opportunities are uh, Marcel who played the German guy, he got a part in like a World War One themed feature film. He seemed to think it was because of this project so I'm glad that it's helping people and I'm glad that it's it's kind of had a little bit of life afterwards. So that's kind of it really. Um, I hope you've taken something from this. I hope this has been helpful in some way. This is a new thing that me and my friend Will are doing now. Uh, he's going to be releasing his film and he's going to do a video just like this about uh, his experience. So um, we graduated almost a year ago now and we've done uh, quite a bit since then and we're just looking to share our experiences uh, on a platform like this. I'm gonna do more focused videos on like weapons, props and costume, lighting, things like that. Please do leave some feedback on this video down below and also if you have any other questions for any specific things that um, you think I should have covered and you wanna ask any questions, just leave them down below. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day because I won't.